Good morning, everyone. Sorry, we're a minute late. Um, I'm in Denver. We're going to call that my fault. Um, <laughs> I'm an hour ahead of you guys, but still a minute late. Okay. Um, I'm Katie Sealing with the Lighting Design Lab. Um, today, you are going to join us for Eric's fabulous Light Sources and Luminaires presentation. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> this is the first class of our fall series, and I'm remote, you guys. Thank you for giving us some grace. Um, if you haven't uh, been to an LDL webinar, um, during the webinar, you're going to be on mute, but you can use the chat function or questions uh, feature to, to type out your questions, and Eric will answer them as they come in. Um, there are going to be some online or some polls. The feature isn't functioning correctly, partly why we're a minute late, but um, we're still going to give you some time to think about it, and Eric will give you the answers um, at the end. Uh, then at the very end of the webinar, there's a short survey. We're recording this, uh, including the questions that you ask, and we'll put the slide deck and the recording on our website within about a week. There's our email address if you think of anything after the webinar. And just a reminder, Lighting Design Lab is part of Seattle City Light. We are City Light employees um, and uh, City Light is our big brother. Uh, and for those of you who are not too familiar with the Lighting Design Lab, we work with these sort of three buckets of, uh, of y'all, although some of you fall into a couple of those buckets or outside. Um, uh, but we like to think we're in the center, bringing everybody together um, so we all have the same knowledge about these topics. And I think that's it for me. Um, enjoy, I'm gonna go off camera, enjoy your class with Eric today. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, and welcome. Uh, so this class is um, light sources and uh, luminaires. And I'll just say that um, this is actually one of my favorite classes to teach. Uh, I think light sources are really obviously one of the key elements of where lighting begins. Uh, we'll talk about um, how this all goes uh, as we proceed. Um, so I've been at the lab since 1995. Um, uh, I've done kind of all things lighting. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, although in some some areas, I, I maybe know a little more than, than that. Uh, but I've been presenting and writing and doing con consultations and evaluating products for a long time. Uh, I love lighting. What can I say? Um, so let's uh, let's get into uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to look at a light major uh, light source types, um, some lighting metrics uh, and some terminology. Uh, we'll talk about luminaires. Uh, the different types of luminaires, look at some photometry. So if you're looking at uh, manufacturer's literature, help you uh, understand a little bit about what you're looking at, and then um, look at, at also at how to help you specify uh, a little bit when you're when you're looking at luminaires. And you know, and I'll just say, uh, probably should should know this if, if some of you are just beginning. Uh, this is a kind of a fundamental class, so most of you probably are somewhat new to the industry um, you know and if and if this is your first lighting class congratulations and welcome uh, but it certainly won't be your last uh, you know lighting is something I I've been I learn about new thing I, I learn new things about lighting every day uh, and that's one of the things I love about it um, so you know you pick up uh, knowledge as you go and um, take classes and look around around and that's that's the best way uh, and in fact seeing you know obviously lighting is about seeing and um, you know depending on different different types of science you know about as much as 80% of how we perceive the world comes through our eyes 
Um, there might be those who say well, we get a lot of information on a subconscious level uh, from other areas, and uh, we're not really going to get too much into that. Uh, but the upshot is um, vision uh, really has a, has a strong impact on how we think about the world and how we feel about the world. So, you know, the, 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 how we see and how we perceive and how we gather that visual information is kind of complicated. So we're talking about light sources uh, in this class uh, and luminaires. And of course, it's pretty rare that we actually utilize or look at light sources directly. Um, and this is based on an IES, uh, the Illuminating Engineering Society um, graphic that they have. I've changed it a little bit, um, but I haven't changed the basic premise, uh, which is that we have light sources. Um, and some of those are natural, obviously candles and uh, you know, that's not, you know, flames, the sun, and then some uh, mostly what we're going to focus on in this class is electric light sources. Um, but primarily modifiers uh, have an impact on how we do lighting and uh, modifiers can be anything from, um, uh, here's a, a quick question, Katie, maybe you can help me with, do, can you see my cursor moving around? Don't know if you're still with me. I am, I cannot see it. Okay, I, but I'm, good to I'm know. on a laptop. Let me try. Oh, now I can. <laughs> oh, you can. Okay. To, okay. I had to move a box around. No, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> so yeah. Um. So we take light sources and we modify them. We either have uh, shades or lenses, or we take that light source and we bounce it off of a surface, um, so it can light the space. Uh, or the light sources travel through a medium, uh, whether it be a window or a lens of some kind. Uh, to come into the space. Uh, so it's pretty rare that we're looking directly at light sources. Um, but that's really only the beginning of a vision. Uh, so then we have the, an eye. Uh, and of course, that's a mechanical biological device. It has a lens, it has, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the eye later, uh, but that's our basic receptor. Um, but then there's also the perception. We have to interpret what we see. Uh, so all of these things come to play to make uh, to make lighting. Um, so here's a fun fact: uh, stars are light sources, right? The sun is a star, and the stars are you know we're seeing a light source directly. But the moon is a modifier, right? So we take a big a big surface, we shine light on it, bounces back, and that's moonlight. Uh, so. Anyway, there you go. Uh, so light, um, you know, generally when we talk about light, it's just one small part of this electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, it happens to be a part that is within the realm of visibility, the visible spectrum, we call it. Uh, we're also interested in some of the shoulder areas, ultraviolet light, we can't really see it directly, and infrared light. Uh, those are elements that the lighting designer needs to know about, whether you're using controls that use infrared, or you're concerned about heat energy in, uh, in your lighting system, or whether there's, there's ultraviolet, uh, if you're using that to maybe disinfect, or if you're concerned with uh, degradation of materials, you may be trying to filter out ultraviolet light. Okay, um, so this is not a biology class, uh, but basically there's some elements. So we have the the eye, the iris that allows, that can change and allow a certain more or less light in. We have a lens, um, but then we have these receptors uh, at the back of the eye um, and they fall into two broad buckets, if you will. Uh, we have uh, light and dark receptors and those are we call cones. And there's a lot of cones and they kind of give us, help us, you can see here's a, uh, rather the, the, those are the rods, my mistake. So the rods are for light and dark and they, they take up a, a large area uh, of, our, uh, of our 
the back of the of our receptors, um, and they help with peripheral vision. And then there's cones that are for color. It's one way I try to remember is cone and color start with C. And the primary co colors of perception are blue, red, and green. And um, you know, it's a little like a uh, computer screen or something where you, if you look, there's little pixels of uh, red, blue, green, we call it RGB. And um, those all come together to make a complex uh, color balance. We can get any, any uh, color in the spectrum by mixing those. And I will say that this is all um, high level and Biological perception is one of those things that the more the more you dig into it, the more you'll realize how much you don't really know. So someone out there might be may know uh, more about this, and they'll say, "Well, it's not really three receptors, and there's 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 different ways to put it." But for the purposes of this class and for general lighting design, um, it's good enough to know that that that's how it goes. If you want to get more into it, Wikipedia or or there's uh, lots of other other ways you can find out more. <clears throat> so, so we talked. So, that, so we have these receptors of light. We have the light sources. We just talked about this visible spectrum, uh, and then we have light enters the eye. Patterns of light and dark. You know, and the eye is always looking. We're always looking to find meaning in <clears throat> in the outside world. We look around. It's you know, it's, it's phenomenal. We can be in a stadium thousands of people and we can you know look across and maybe we recognize somebody just that little dot in all of that we say hey there's larry over there or, you know there's somebody in a, we see someone in a crowd um so we're always looking for patterns and as you can see here we have just sort of visual chaos and noise but it doesn't take much uh to get us to start to recognize something in all that patterning uh, I, I don't know, this is a little optical illusion, but uh, you can kind of see that there's a dog here with their nose down and maybe a tail coming up. At least that's that's what I see, uh, and that's what most people uh, see once they look at that. So it's, it's quite amazing. Um, and that's where vision happens, is in the brain, um, <clears throat> potentially, uh, or at least recognition. All right, so enough about that. Um, get into uh, some of the light source characteristics. And light sources have, you know, you can categorize them all kinds of different ways. Um, you can talk about the shape of the light uh, that comes out of, whether it's a, a, a little dot of light or a big plane of light, a big, wide, large light source. Uh, sometimes we have light sources that are uh, by nature somewhat linear. Um, I will say the LED revolution has changed uh, some of how we think about light sources, but uh, a lot of the things really aren't aren't that different um, once you get uh, down to it. So we have to, we have to be aware of the shape of the of the source that we're dealing with, and that could be um, like I say, if it's an LED, it could be really more integrated into a luminaire. Um, Sometimes we have LEDs that are separate from the luminaire. Uh, mostly those are retrofits, but if we're looking at luminaires with LEDs, they're usually built together. Um, one thing we're interested in is obviously intensity, how how much light we're getting. Uh, we're also concerned with efficacy, how much, what's the what's the cost of generating that light? Uh, usually we're looking at uh, not so much dollar cost, although it could be, it could be how much are we paying, but it also could be what's the carbon cost, how much energy does it take to create this light. Um, we're interested in how long they last. Uh, so, you know, if something doesn't last very long, it means a lot of maintenance. Uh, that's usually translates into either dollars or at least time. Uh, and um, that can be a a big factor. It also could uh, have a safety issue if they're burning out a lot or failing frequently. Uh, we may have an unsafe condition. Um, and then we're thinking about the color of the light, uh, and that gets a little bit into the our emotional responses, but also it may have some bearing on 
uh, how we perceive the space and how well we can do uh, how uh, productivity and, and um, how easy it is to to uh, function. Uh, and then related somewhat to that, or at least in the same conversation usually is uh, color rendering. And that's how well the light source will reveal the sort of true colors uh, of a space. And again, that can get into uh, a quality of life issue, but it also can be a safety issue and a productivity issue if we're not able to uh, recognize color easily. So point sources um, tend to be uh, easy to control. They tend to be a, have a hard shadow so we can see we're getting these dramatic lines of light and dark. Um, uh, it, it, strangely enough, uh, whether or not something's a point source or perceived that way is, has, is a function of many things that has to do with the distance it is from the object it's lighting. So the sun is considered a point source, but it's you know vast, it's huge, but it's also millions of miles away. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, can be easily aimed in focus. Uh, hard, hard, you can get hard shadows, uh, can create visual interest and sparkle, a lot of drama. Um, not always appropriate for every application. Linear sources, um, again, can help uh, define a space. Uh, they can uh, uh, be a way to provide some general uniform lighting depending on how you uh, apply them, um, often minimizing contrast, uh, and they can also be helped for wayfinding uh, if you're trying to draw people through a space. And then we have, uh, we'll call them planar type sources, uh, very diffuse, um, you know, we have a, a space lit with big skylights, diffuse skylights. Uh, we have all indirect lighting in a space. Um, we now have light sources themselves that are by nature planar. Uh, and so you get um, almost, if it's done perfectly, you get shadowless light. And um, that can be helpful in some ways. It can also be, you know, there was a time, especially when indirect lighting was being promoted a lot, you get what's called the cloudy day effect. And, um, you know, uh, it's it's pretty rare that you would have only indirect lighting uh, or diffuse lighting, lighting a space. Uh, often you add some accent lighting, you might do that with point sources. So you'd light some artwork or you'd have some decorative fixtures, that kind of thing. Um, so it's pretty rare that you have only one of these types of sources, but it's not uh, uncommon to, to know about those things. So um we're gonna here's a little poll uh and i think katie mentioned we're having a, a, some glitches with our our poll so uh what i'm gonna do is kind of go through these and then give you a few minutes to think about it and then we'll talk about it so which of these are lighting modifiers uh a reflector uh the moon a wall a green candle and the optic nerve and so in, in this case, there would be multiple right answers. Uh, and um, so uh, a reflector would be a, a modifier. Uh, we're taking that light and changing its direction. Um, we can also, as we see later, we can reflect it and change its quality. Uh, the moon, right, we talked about that uh, as being a modifier. Um, uh, and a wall, we talked about modifier there. We can bounce light off a wall into an interior space. Um, a green candle, uh, that was a little bit of a trick question, although it could be argued that uh, depending on how the candle's burning, uh, you could get a little bit of green cast to the light. But uh, my intention was that no, the, it doesn't matter what color the candle is, it, we're still getting, it's still a light source. Uh, and then of course the optic nerve, um, you know, we could also argue that that might be a modifier, but it's really not, uh, ideally, it's not changing anything uh, about the light source. So moving on, uh, and we come to our Eric. candle. Uh, yes, we have questions. 
We don't. I just wanted to um, remind everybody, go ahead and type a question in at any time in the chat, um, and we will get to it um, as soon as we can. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Yeah, I'm I'm not great at uh, reminding people of those things. So yeah, um, all right. So intensity. Um, <clears throat> There's different ways to talk about the intensity of a light source. Uh, foundational to that is the basic lumen. Um, and, you know, you, so you can go into the IES definitions and find all kinds of complex scientific uh, definitions for these things. Um, you know, in this class, we're not going to get too much into that, but it's, it's basically a unit of luminous flux. Uh, Basically, you know, the, the amount of lumens we get from a light source is the total no, amount of light emitted by that light source. Uh, and we'll come as we go, we'll talk about uh, foot candles or candle power. Uh, back in the early days, candles were kind of what we had, and they were able to create a scientific standard candle. Um, and so when that, you know, because of course, as you see, a birthday candle is different than, you know, a uh, tiki torch type candle. So, you know, what's a candle? Um, and so they would have a scientific candle. And um, uh, and so the amount of light, that was one, one candela. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we'll see as we go is you'll take that candle and put it inside a space, whether it's a, 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 a sphere that's a foot, 12 inches in, uh, in diameter or, or a meter, you can have a, you know, and depending on which one you use, you either get foot candles or you'll get uh, lux. Lux is the international standard. We'll come back to that. So um, let's see. I'm going to do a little modification here, a little demonstration. So uh, one thing that we talk about with especially directional sources, um, which sort of have been modified, so they've been modified with a reflector, but we'll see directional sources, and this is somewhat true too with uh, luminaires uh, that are directional, is we have a beam angle uh, and then a field angle. We don't use field angles so much, but you'll see beam angle in the spec sheets uh, a fair bit. And the beam angle is the angle at which the light drops to 50% of the center beam candle power. That's what CBC, uh, <laughs> CBCP stands for. So center beam candle power right there, that's the center beam. And when it drops to uh, 50%, that's the beam angle. So let's take a look here. What am I talking about? Um, so here's a... Uh, directional light source, right? And we can see it has a beam that's a certain size. Uh, and then if we hold it up, you can see that um, uh, a lot of that light comes into the beam. That's where a lot of it is. But there's also light outside that beam. And that, that we call that where it drops to 10%. All of it until it gets to 10% is considered the field angle. Um, and you need to be aware of the field angle, A, because it can help with overlapping. Sometimes when you're overlapping light sources, you, you allow for that to get uniform lighting, but also it can create glare. Here's another light source, looks similar, um, but it really has a very soft beam and almost no, no real, it's a very wide, diffuse light source it's hard to really maybe the, the camera is kind of showing a little bit more of its of its uh intensity drop off but you compare it to uh this other one and you can see there's a very distinct beam so you those are two different similar light sources but you'd be using them two different ways one's a flood uh nominally we call it a flood or a spot and so we go back to here Often the beam is just referred to as flood, spot, or medium. You know, sort of if casual conversation, you say, yeah, we need some spotlights over here and have some floodlights over there. But at some point you're gonna have to specify, well, if, if I've got 
you know, a 10 degree beam, or, or let's use something, let's say 15 degree beam, that would be fairly narrow beam, uh, compared to say a 25 degree beam, that might be a little wider, but they most, both might can be considered spotlights as a compared to something that would be a floodlight, which might be more like 45 or even 60 degrees. So, um, yeah, so there we go. We need, we need, uh, we need the numbers if you're really going to get into specification. All right, so here's a, another little demonstration, uh, maybe pulling some of this stuff together. So we have our light source, so, uh, and I haven't really mentioned this yet. Um, so class is called light sources and luminaires. So I, I, as a nerdy guy, I talk about light sources, but really in the industry we call we call them lamps. All right, so a uh, uh, this is a lamp, um, and uh, not to be confused with a table lamp or a floor lamp. And you know, honestly, if you're talking to a, a client, maybe a user, an end user who's not, you know, in in the spec in the design community, you might talk about light bulbs. No reason not to call this a light bulb. Say, yeah, we're going to change all the light bulbs in your facility. If you say we're going to change all the lamps, you might just have to do a lot of explaining. And if you talk about light sources, forget it. All right, anyway, so here's our lamp inside of this luminaire, um, and it's putting out a certain amount of light. Uh, and so then it shines onto uh, a task, and we would measure that. We might take our light meter out. Uh, what did I do with it? Well, I'll get it later. We have a light meter. We'd put that um, down on the surface, and we'd measure a certain amount of light. We'd say, okay, this is how much light we've got. Um, and we would measure that in foot candles or lux. But that's not actually how we see. We see reflected light. You're thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, you know. And we we measure that in luminance, uh, and we talk about that candelas per meter squared. The old style term for that would be foot lambert, so almost never use that. But you might see it in some old specifications or some old documents. That's what that means. But now we use candela per meter squared, and we're going to lux more and more. But lux and foot candles are sort of the same. Uh, so, but what we see is reflected light. And that makes a difference because if we change the nature of the task, we haven't really changed anything about how much light strikes the surface, still the same amount of light hitting that surface, but the visual task is very different. Uh, we're changing the reflectances, the background, a lot of things, but we're not changing the amount of light coming out of this, but we are having a very different visual experience. Okay, so if you're excited by all this uh, talk, you can go to the IS, they have a, uh, a um, definitions and nomenclature, and you can get pretty deep into all these things. Um, I just wanted to sort of lay out the landscape on some of this. Um, all right, so moving on from, from a quantity of light, now we get into uh, efficacy. How much uh, work do we get? How much light do we get for a given amount of power? And it's a little like miles per gallon. Um, so uh, different light sources back in the days before LEDs. So this is a little bit of an old slide, but it's it's good to know kind of why we're excited by LEDs. So we have, and we'll talk about some of these light sources later, but not a lot. Uh, high pressure sodium, HPS, often used in street lighting, lighting parks, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it would be about 70 to 145 lumens per watt. That number has no meaning sitting there by itself, but we start comparing it to some things. Metal halide, um, you know, say 70 to about 120 lumens per watt. Uh, a little higher, better metal halide might be 80 to 125 lumens per watt, but it's sort of, it's a little less light generally. Um, induction lighting was a, a, you know, if LEDs had never come along, we'd be talking a lot about induction lighting. It's pretty good lumens per watt, but noticeably less. Uh, incandescent light. Okay, so we still see an incandescent lights out there. Um, and so what you need to know is a regular, the regular old incandescent light bulb is about 8 to 13, if we 
throw halogen, the, the high-end halogen infrared in there, we might get as much as 36 or 35 lumens per watt. That's a much smaller number than these numbers. So that means we're getting less light for more work, uh, more energy. Uh, compact fluorescence, we've all heard of those. Uh, we're not using those as much anymore, but they're better than incandescent. Uh, but not by much. And then the linear tubes, the long fluorescent tubes, 60 to 90 lumens per watts, that's a pretty big number, which is why we see, had historically have used them throughout our commercial spaces. Uh, we get a lot of light, almost 100 lumens per watt. And LEDs are all over the map. This is a little old. I don't think we're really seeing any LEDs out there that are 50 lumens per watt, but they're, they're over 100, almost 200 lumens per watt uh, in some cases. So, uh that's exciting that in itself you know puts it in, sort of in the same ballpark as high pressure sodium but we'll see that as we go that there's a lot of reasons why you would choose an led over high pressure sodium for reasons other than just energy efficiency um so here's another a little graph and we can see how the in the industry trends are clear uh you know, there's been, so, so this is 1880, uh, the year. Here we are coming into the uh, the current times, and we can see that incandescent lighting was improving slowly over time. Uh, some other types of light sources, uh, fluorescent hal uh, was improving. Uh, we had uh, metal halide lamps improving pretty, pretty good. Then LEDs hit the market and boom, there's almost no, uh, research and development being done in any other light source other than LED today. Uh, rated lamp life, again, we talked about that a little bit. Um, so if lights are burning out a lot, we have a cost to change them, and we also have potentially safety issues. So here's an incandescent light, regular 100-watt bulb. It hardly registers. It's made about 1,000 hours, maybe some of the some of 2,500 hours. So we're changing these bulbs a lot. Uh, uh, compact fluorescent triple tube, linear T8s. Um, we get into LEDs, uh, just the regular screw-in products that you buy at, at the hardware store are just about as good as some of the best of our fluorescents. Uh, and then we have other LEDs that are lasting uh, much, much longer. Uh, these are, you know, th tens of thousands of hours. So uh, that's a good thing. How do we measure rated life? And I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on this, uh, primarily because uh, with the LED revolution, it doesn't quite make as much sense as it did, but it's good to know because sometimes you'll be comparing life um, to other things. So here we have um, <clears throat> the, the, the way they would do this is they take a large sample of lights of a given light source, maybe a hundred light sources, put them in the laboratory and they would cycle them uh, three hours on, 15 minutes off, three hours on, 15 minutes off. Uh, and when they, when half of them burned out, so when you say had, if you had a hundred bulbs to start with, um, uh, or maybe uh, then um, when half of them burned out, that would be the rated life. So here's our hundred bulbs, and they we we burn them. This is time moving on, and and now we have, uh, or the percentage rather, none of them have burned out at at day one, but by the time we get in here. Uh, half of them have burned out, and that is our rated life. Some of them are going to last longer. Some will last 140% of rated life or, or even longer. There's some bulbs that just keep going just because of circumstances uh, and the way they were uh, the way they were built. Um, so, and if you have a light source that lasts, say, a thousand hours, um, <clears throat> that's from a practical standpoint, it takes some time, but it's doable to actually do real-time testing. Um, there's 8,700 hours in a year. Uh, so if I'm if I'm looking at a thousand hours, I can you know in a few months 
I have cycling those lights, I can um, I can get that 50% uh, number, even with a you know a fluorescent that's maybe lasting uh, 20,000 hours or so. I can I can come up with some some good data. But if you've got a light source that's supposed to last 60,000 hours, that's years and years, and you can't wait. You can't keep that in the in the lab testing it. You want to bring it to market, start selling it. Uh, so um, you know that we'll we'll talk in a moment about how we uh, look at some of these other ways to determine lamp life. And there are other ways to determine lamp life. Obviously, with a particularly incandescent bulbs, we know when it's burned out. It just doesn't deliver light. Uh, but sometimes things have a, a color shift, right? So here's a a meeting room, or maybe it's in a, an airport, and we see these uh wall grazers coming down and day one these were all the same color they were probably all about this color and over time some of them gotten a little pink that's probably acceptable this one's gotten a lot more pink maybe not acceptable this one's gone green you know they were all the same when they started so from an architectural standpoint an aesthetic standpoint, I'm feeling like these. this is a problem. So I probably have to get out the, the lift or the ladder, go up there and change those bulbs. Um, and efficacy reduction, they start to deliver less light. You know, we can see blackening here. So that's just less light coming out of that system. And so the, the lumens start to drop off. Uh, occasionally the lamps will start to cycle. Can't really see this in a static slide, but we might have one of these that started to blink. It's blinking on and off, and there's components that are heating up, overheating, shutting down, cooling down, starts all over again, heats up, overheats, shuts down. So that's not good. Uh, some light sources become unstable, uh, and they may actually explode. Um, and if you've got a food processing facility or some other thing like that, it's a real safety uh, issue. Probability of failure increases. All right, so we'll go back to this slide just briefly. Um, so here, you know, as we get past this 50%, these are going to start failing quicker and quicker, more and more. We're going to have less lights that survive, only 20% now at, at 120% of rated life. Uh, so they're going to start burning out. Um, so there's this thing called L70, life 70. What that means, the point at which only 70% of the initial lumens are still being emitted, right? So the light source has gotten dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And once, it, once it's lost 30% of its light, its service life is considered to be over. Uh, again, if we're lighting a loading dock or maybe a, a, a stairwell, there could be a safety issue if we're not getting as much light as we are uh, hoping for. And some light sources um, maintain their light levels pretty well. So here's our percentage of light, 75%, 85%, 95%, 100%. Um, so this light source, is, this is a, let's take this T8 fluorescent, as it progresses through its rated life, it's 100% rated life, it only loses maybe uh, 15, 20, uh, 10% of its, of its light. So it never hits that L70 point. But other light sources, like this mercury vapor, it drops like a stone. But it, one thing it doesn't show you is the mercury vapor sort of just keeps going and going. And you see some installations where it's really dim, but the, the ball hasn't burned out. Um, so anyway, uh, and so no one changes it. Um, so that can be a problem, and that that's an issue with LEDs uh, potentially, and and sort of practically, is they don't actually burn out the way uh, an incandescent might burn out. They just sort of keep going, and so the concern is that they won't uh, be maintained past their uh, L70 point. So the industry has come up with um, <clears throat> a couple of methods to help specifiers understand what's happening. So this is really particular only to LEDs. So you kind of need to know this. Um, so we have our L70, time at which it reaches 70% uh, lumen output. But again, uh, if we've got something that's rated at tens of thousands of hours, we can't 
actually measure it. So we have to take measurements in the laboratory and project that out in time to where we think it's going to fail uh, or where we think it's going to reach that L70 point. So we do some testing. Uh, the IES has come up with a standard measurement, um, LM80, um, for measuring lumen depreciation. We're not going to get into all the details of that in this class, uh, but it's a very, and really as a specifier, you don't really need to know how to do it, but you do need to know that this number exists and this number exists and what they are. And so what they do in the laboratory is they, they do uh, testing measurements uh, and they take readings at very specific time intervals uh, and get data. And so once they get that data, and I think they have to do it for at least 10,000 hours, they can, sometimes they can do it for as few as 6,000, but um, so that would be a little over a year of, of data gathering uh, for those 8,700 hours in a year. Um, and so then, as we all know, you can, have not, you can have data and you can manipulate that various ways to get different outcomes, right? So, the industry found out pretty quickly that just gathering the data was not enough. They had to come up with a, a method for calculating it. So everybody would be gathering data the same way, all the manufacturers of, of light sources, of LEDs, and they've been then re recalculating, reporting the data the same way. So you could compare, as they say, apples to apples. Um, so they have the TM21, reporter calculated based on, based on LM80 data. Uh, so, uh, so now you can, you in theory, uh, if a manufacturer says, well, we reach L70 at 58,000 hours, you can have some assurity if they're a reputable manufacturer that they've gone through this process and that that's actually where it's going to be. Sometimes people are, don't care as much about L70. They want to, they want a very stable light source. They want to know when are we going to reach the point where it's only lost 10% of its light. We want 90%. We don't want it to go below 30%, below 10%. So there'd be L90, there might be L80, L, uh, and then L70, though, is sort of the, the baseline, if you will. Does this make any sense? You get any questions? It's kind of, anyway, well, I think there's a, we did, another one here. We did just What's get that? a question. We did just okay. get a question that says part of the presentation is cut off. Can you scale the screen size down? Oh wow! Um, but I don't uh, on mine. I don't see part of the presentation cut off. Um, okay. So if that's happening to anyone out there, you might go to the top of your um, menu bar and and try to do a different zoom level. Um, it, it looks okay to me. Yeah. Um, tell you what. If how many. Maybe we could get a sense if other people are seeing that. If if so, I could go out of presentation mode and go to a different mode. Nope, nope. Actually, it looks like he figured it out. Thanks, Manuelito. Oh, dynamite. Okay. Well, great. Thanks for the feedback, and uh, we'll forge ahead. All right. So um, now there. So we talked about L70 uh, and then LM80 and TM21. There's another bit of stuff that you will probably need to be aware of m more as a re as a specifier or someone who's evaluating luminaires um, and that's this lm79 report and that is uh where you get uh all the all the data about that luminaire that you're looking at uh, or in this, or possibly in the case of, of maybe an LED, although usually it's a it's for a luminaire. Uh, so these are reports that are generated, uh, so-called NavLab approved laboratories, uh, national voluntary laboratory uh, something uh, process. I, I uh, geez, I can't believe I forgot what NavLab stands for. I used to crunch this all the time, and now I've spaced it out. But at any rate, um, what this means is that the laboratory has has got standardized scientific equipment that's calibrated at a standard uh, level and a, on a regular basis. And um, so if 
so again, you know, if you're so so if you're gathering data with crummy equipment, that data is no good. So you got to have good equipment calibrated, and now you gather data, you process that data in a uniform way. So everybody, because it used to be the wild west with LEDs, you know, 15, even 20 years ago, I guess now, uh, you couldn't. Every manufacturer is making all kinds of funny claims, uh, and and honestly, they have similar tests for even old style conventional luminaires. So this is nothing really particular to LEDs, but LEDs were unusual. So the NAVLAP report will tell you the efficacy, the lumens per watt. It'll give you information about the color properties of the luminaire. It'll talk about a light distribution from that luminaire uh, in different ways, photometric reports, um, and it has to be signed off on. So that LM79 report is going to be another uh, another tool you'll use. So here's another one of these little polls, and um, we'll just uh, go through this one uh, quickly. Uh, so how is the beam angle of the light source defined? And um, I think this might be uh, multiple choice, or uh, there'd be multiple correct answers. So we, we say in degrees, uh, the angle at which the light from the center beam candle power drops by 50%. Uh, the angle at which the light from the center beam candle power drops to 10% in foot candles as either wide spot or narrow. So uh, the answer would be, a few answers are correct here. It, it is in degrees um, and it is in fact the angle at which the light drops to 50%. Um, we don't really talk about foot candles uh, in terms of for the beam angle, um, but we can in casual conversation talk about wide spot or narrow. So that it's not really defined that way, but we, you can refer to it that way. So it'd be the correct answers would be A, B, and E uh, potentially. We have All a right. question. Ooh, excellent! <laughs> Hit me. Okay. Can you speak to the designed obsolescence that is in quotes that is prevalent in the lighting industry? The design obsolescence. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, I have to say, LEDs have really shaken the lighting industry, completely shaken it up. Because, and, and I don't know if this really speaks to the question. We could. I'm happy to. to pivot if, if it's but I'll answer this question in the old days especially the days of incandescent you had a big industry of people going around changing light bulbs selling light bulbs uh, you know General Electric they got most of their money by selling light bulbs well I don't know at least in their lighting division Sylvania you know uh, they had all kinds of light bulbs that they would sell you know lamps uh, and all different types and for all different applications and that's all been thrown out most of those companies you know GE has sold off its lighting division uh, Sylvania same thing I mean it's so because LEDs last so long uh, that whole market um, business model just disappeared uh, not overnight but practically um, so uh, so that was planned obsolescence, and it, it's interesting that this disruptive technology, you know, the the LED, um, got rid of all that. So now, you, in theory, you buy a, a luminaire that's with LEDs, and unless there's some failure, you know, mechanical failure or something, you know, you put that up, and ten years later, you maybe need to put up a new one or change out something in it. Uh, so does that sp speak to the well, and then she added something else um, that it, she was specifically referencing um, retrofitting, i.e. relamp or new fixtures for T8 to T12 or T5s. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we'll touch on that a little bit. I, I think there is a class coming up on retrofits and audits uh next week by the way um you know there's a whole sort of cottage industry around these so-called t-leds where you would take out a fluorescent tube 
and put in an LED in the same fixture without really doing much or any modifications, at least that's the theory. Um, so if so I wouldn't call that planned obsolescence so much as a, a retrofit. Um, you know, the, you know, one of the things about the fluorescent tubes is they did last a long time for the most part. So you could put in a fluorescent tube and it would be a few years at least before you would need to change those out. Um, so that was a area where the industry actually, I don't know that was planned obsolescence, but you know, they, they were very competitive who could make the longest fluorescent, la longest lasting fluorescent tube. Um, you know, and so that, that was almost a planned unobsolescence, if you will, um, <clears throat> just to get an edge. Um, okay. So, but we'll, we'll move on, but I'm maybe, uh, if that doesn't answer your question, send us, send me an email, uh, or give me a call. We can talk about it. I'm happy to, to go on. All right. So we've talked about the, you know, life of the light sources, the amount of light from light sources. But of course, the thing most people care about is how does it look, right? The color qualities. And here we have two architectural light sources, two light sources that would were, would be used and have been used in the real world. Um, the, the one on below is a low pressure sodium. And you know, there's places where uh, that's used for street lighting or lighting in parks. Um, and of course, the one above is uh, just a, a nice high quality. Uh, it, in this case, it's a, um, a metal halide, but um, uh, still, uh, it's a, we see that they're very different. And we can uh, one of the things we notice right off the bat is one's yellowish and one's whitish or maybe bluish. We don't really know, but we can also see these are the same cars. So the color characteristics are dramatically different. So let's talk about that. Um, so we'll, you'll hear the term color temperature, sometimes correlated color temperature, uh, or you'll see CCT. Um, not sure I have that on this slide, uh, but CCT is something that that you might see in a spec sheet or somebody's uh, uh, um, contract. Uh, so CCT, correlated color temperature, is basically how cool or warm the light source is. It's not really thermal, uh, although it's it's based on laboratory thermal analysis. They take a chunk of metal and uh, put it in a so-called black body radiator, which means it's basically a, a, a chamber that absorbs all light. And so the only light you're getting, you're getting no reflected light because, as we'll see later, the this nature of the of the surfaces that are around a light source affect the overall color or the quality and quantity. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it's a little like your, uh, if you have an electric oven or a toaster, you know, you turn the thing on, you don't see anything, but you have, pretty soon you see this glowing red, this dull red. Well, that's light, right? Because, you know, if in a, depending if it's nighttime or something, you wouldn't be able to see inside that oven. It's just a dark area. But once the, once the, once the element is glowing red, you can see the oven racks in there and you can see if you've got some, some dirt spattered or whatever. You can't see very well. It's a very low color temperature. We'll talk about that in a second. And you get it hotter and hotter, it gets white hot. And they do a similar thing in the laboratory with a chunk of specific chunk of metal, they heat it up. And um, once you get over a certain color, you have to project what that would be because you know you're not going to get a a piece of metal to get blue hot, uh, it would just vaporize. Um, so that's where the correlated color temperature part comes in. So here we have our, hopefully you can see this on your screens. We go from a, a warm to cool, and then in the middle is white and uh, you know daylight. So these are color temperatures of natural and, and electric light sources. You know, daylight is, Daylight is really change, is quite variable, but at noon at the equator, um, sunlight is considered to be 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Most people think of sunsets and sunrises and think it's all warm and glowy, uh, but it's not. Uh, and in fact, in fact, I have a little demonstration here. Hopefully this will, will look like something. So here we have um, 
you can see this one. This is if I bought this in the store, it would be called sunlight or daylight, maybe. Uh, very blue. Um, probably a little hard to see here. Uh, but let's turn on this other one. This one's called soft white. So maybe you can see it's a little warmer. Um, especially we'll turn off this other one and turn this one on. This one looks bluer, maybe in your. Uh, so anyway, but so it can be a little confusing um, <clears throat> when you're, especially for the consumer, the, the, and we'll talk about that I think in a minute, the, the labeling. Uh, then we have ink, a candle, very warm, you probably know that, candlelight flames, incandescent light, regular incandescent light bulb, about 2700 Kelvins. Uh, so we talk about these on the Kelvin scale, so I talked about color temperature, we're not using Fahrenheit or centigrade, we're using Kelvins, scientific scale um, and then we have fluorescent sources can be have a whole range some light sources just come one way mostly here's high pressure sodium it really only comes in at yellow um, metal halide has some variability but the thing about LEDs is they can be almost any color temperature and that's the beauty of it we can make them any way but also doesn't mean you need to be uh, particular about how you specify them so you don't end up putting a color in a space that you aren't expecting um, <clears throat> you know, lighting design is, uh, um, just, again, talking about emotion and how we feel about light sources. Certain light sources generally give us, are used in certain, certain colors, are used in certain applications, hospitality, warm light sources. We get into uh, offices and retail. We get into the more neutral sources, and we get into some industrial applications or healthcare, and um, we get into the, the ones that match are, are wider and or rather are just bluer, uh, matching daylight more. <clears throat> so we talked about color temperature (CCT). Now we have this thing called color rendering index, CRI. And, um, you know, when we looked at that first slide I had in this section, we had the, the cars on the bottom. You couldn't tell what color they were at all. They looked the same, but one was blue and one was red. Uh, so that was an example of very poor color rendering. Um, higher color rendering, uh, you, can, you can discriminate color, but, that was a, kind of an extreme example. We do have sources used architecturally um, that have sort of mediocre color rendering. So we, you know, and and we don't really look, no one really knows what color these cars are supposed to be or kind of this foliage, but we look at people's complexion, right? And if people don't look healthy, we just don't get a good feeling about the space. Um, whereas if people's complexions are healthy, this is all subconscious. We you know, we have, we feel better about being in the space. And if you're in retail uh, or hospitality, you certainly want people to feel comfortable um, and you want colors to be vibrant, maybe not more vibrant than they actually are. Uh, and that gets us into something we'll talk about in a minute, but um, you still want the colors to be true. Uh, if nothing else, so you don't get a lot of returns. If someone buys something, they think they're getting navy blue and they get it, home or they get out in the daylight and it turns out it's it's slight gray uh they might be dissatisfied because it wasn't what they wanted they have to take it back okay um <clears throat> so with color uh temperature there's different colors temperatures that are appropriate for certain applications but with color rendering it's just a case the higher the better uh, now, once you get into some of these extremes, we'll see later that maybe that's, you don't always want to go for the m highest possible color rendering in every application, because uh, there's other factors to consider. Um, but the good news is most LEDs today are going to be at least 70 uh, and usually 80, and, and you can certainly get them higher. Um, so it's not as big a problem as it as it was uh, with some of the other light sources where you could get down into this range without really knowing it. But you do have to look at the color rendering uh, and and make sure that it, when you're looking at, say someone offers a product that's a lot cheaper, well, it might have taken it from 85 down to 70. And that might be fine, 
but you just want to know going in that, okay, colors are not going to look quite as vibrant as they were. Uh, and that can be a factor if even in industry, right? If someone's having to match up wires and they have an orange wire and a red wire, they need to be able to tell quickly and accurately um, which wire they're picking up or, or connecting. Uh, you know, if you're out on a roadway or some exterior and you need to identify things quickly. So here we have high pressure sodium used for exterior a lot. And we can see that certain colors are very dull uh, under that light source. We get into mercury vapor and you know, some of the colors pop, but other colors really recede. Um, and that might be a problem if you're trying to draw people's attention to something. Uh, wouldn't it be good if we had a light source where all the colors were equally vibrant and we didn't have to choose or make some accommodation? So that's where a higher color rendering CRI 80 Here's 15. We don't use mercury vapor anymore, really, or high pressure sodium, but that just to, to show you. Um, <clears throat> so, first, to perceive color, uh, we talked earlier about the eye has those receptors that can pick up red, blue, and green uh, nominally. And uh, so, we need to have that color in the, in the object. Right, so no amount of blue light that I sh or that I shine on this red apple is going to make it look blue. It'll just make it look sort of gray or black or something. But I won't. I need to have to make this look red. I have to have red light reflecting, shining on a red object to reflect back. Same thing with the green. Um, here we have a monochromatic light source, uh, and I'm not getting you know, much good stuff. Um, but Beyond that, we have to be able to perceive that color. Um, so, you know, uh, we know that a fairly high percentage of people have some degree of color blindness, uh, particularly men. Um, and so, then why would you know? I mean, that's that's a drag. But why do we care? One reason we might care uh, is if we're making signage, uh, that is, say, in an airport, or if we're uh, cautionary signage or just even just readability for directions. Um, we want to be sure that we're picking colors uh, that we know everybody's going to see. That's not really a lighting issue, um, but it is it does factor into uh, the, the light sources that we use. It will be a factor. And also, you know, we've also know that other animals perhaps perceive differently. We might see this bird this way, but another bird would look at that same bird under daylight and it look very different. Insects, uh, same thing. So those are what we need to be aware of. A little bit on daylighting. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is a class about light sources and daylight is certainly a, a primary light source. And more and more as we're trying to get more efficient buildings, higher quality buildings, um, we utilize daylight. Um, we'll see that, you know, there's a reason daylight, daylight's a little hard to manage um, for, for a variety of reasons, but it also brings a lot of benefit if we can do it correctly. So there's uh, at least five important factors, uh, functions in a building. Uh, so we get usable light levels for the occupant, right? So if we allow some daylight in, especially if we do it properly, uh, we get light for free. Uh, it's a connection to the outdoors, right? People don't like to work in like a basement. Uh, usually that's a, you know, or a windowless room, you know, even if it's not in the basement uh, or a cubicle that's stuck back into the core of the building where they can't really tell whether it's day or night and let alone w what's happening outside. Uh, it's it's not it's not good. And then view quarter out the eye muscles to relax. And you're thinking, well, really, what's that mean? Um, so if we've all had that feeling, we're you know we're driving along the freeway or something, we're going to the beach, we're going someplace, we finally get to where we're going, and we get out and we we look at this big expanse, this big view, and it, it's just like ah, that feels good. Um, and that's because when we're at a say a, particularly at a desk or even in a you know a, a relatively large office our eyes are still having to our eye muscles have to focus on close in 
things. And so if we can, if we have something that's far in the distance, our eyes, our eye muscles relax and that can be uh, beneficial. Um, one of the problems with daylight is it's so variable. Now, of course, that's, that's actually a benefit too. Uh, well, I think we'll talk about it in a second, but you know, we look here, so in December, you know, we're not getting much daylight for a shorter period of time. There's less of it. We get into June and we get uh, a longer period duration and there's a lot more of it. Uh, and then of course it's changing its angle. Sometimes it's low on the horizon. Sometimes it's high. Sometimes it's coming straight into the building. Sometimes it's the building shaded. Uh, so it's pretty messy. And for a while, the Illuminating Engineering Society, this is back, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, once we had all these electric light sources that were high power, we were like, well, heck, we don't need daylight. Let's get rid of the windows because they're too messy. They they are distraction. Uh, we'll just use electric light. And that turned out not to be a great idea. Oh, here we go. Yeah, even during a day, we can get all this variation, whether it's cloudy or sunny, clear. Uh, so we have different, you know, direct sun, clear blue sky, partly cloudy sky, overcast sky, and generally want to maximize the diffuse natural illumination. Uh, and I think we'll agree. Uh, so we're going to look um, later on at some spectral power distribution of light sources. But, you know, we talked before about how uh, we need to have the color in the light source to be able to perceive color in objects. And this would be considered a so-called full spectrum light source. It's got all those parts in it. So I mentioned there were five things, uh, and I only mentioned, and I, we had three, but here's two more. Uh, a dynamic and variable workspace, right? So we were talking about how indirect lighting, or early in the slides, we we're talking about the different kinds of lights. And I said, we get sort of the cloudy day effect with indirect lighting. So imagine you walk into a space, you know, and you turn on the lights, and it's 40 foot candles, no shadows, all day long, doesn't change. You know, it's almost like sensory deprivation. Uh, same thing with the with mechanical systems we're finding out. You know, if the temperature then ever changes a little bit, or if, it, if we don't get any any variation in our uh, breezes coming from the the mechanical system, all those things help us feel like we're in a space that's dynamic. And then, of course, the broad spectrum is to stimulate human physiology. There's whole classes on uh, on this subject, which we won't get into uh, in this class today. Uh, but daylight, even at the same moment, can have varying qualities. I like this picture. So this is a east-facing mixed overcast morning, and we get blue light. We get some uh, scattered light changing. We get white light. Uh, we get sort of purpley, all these different things uh, coming off of buildings, off of clouds, uh, coming into the into the space. Okay, another poll. Uh, color temperature. Tell us how cool or warm a light source is. Tell us whether a light source is bluish or yellowish. Is listed as CRI, is listed in Kelvins, is dependent on color rendering. Okay, so color temperature uh, does tell us how warm or cool a light source is and tells us whether the light source is bluish or yellowish. It's not CRI, that's color rendering index. Color temperature would be CCT and that is usually listed in Kelvins. Sometimes it's just the K. They might say it's 3700 K. Um, uh, and is not dependent on color rendering. Now they they're real, they're not really related, but they often are listed this together, uh, or they come up in the same conversation. But just because they're both about color properties. Okay, electric Wait light for, sources. We're gonna yeah. Wait for a second. <laughs> um, yeah. We have one question going back to um, the seventy percent of life for for bulbs. Yeah. Um, okay. And it is. It is how does an end user know that an LED is at 70 percent? Um, you don't. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. So, so what you if you're as a specifier, you'd say, okay, um, we're going to get these this lighting system, and we know it's going to hit 
uh, L70 at 60,000 hours. And so we would project out that uh, that might be, you know, I, I'm not going to do the math, but that might be nine years, let's say. Uh, so we know that in nine years, we need to start thinking about changing out uh, the lighting system. Um, as an end user, the only way you would really know, <laughs> you know, is if you took a light re meter reading at the day one, right? And then every couple months took another reading uh, until that number, assuming your meter was holding its calibration all that time, uh, got to to where it was 30% less. So yeah, as an end user, not so much. Now, if you're a lighting, if you're a maintenance operator, uh, that might be something you'd, you'd pay attention to. Um, and you might take periodic light level readings. Uh, there might be some other factor that's causing an early degradation, maybe too, maybe a heat thermal issue. So there could be reasons why it, why it could happen prematurely, and you might wanna know that. Um, but as an end user, it's it's not something you're going to really deal with. Um, other than if you walk into a building, let's say you say you're a new tenant in a in an existing building, and you come in, and the lighting's all dim, you might be like, "Hey, well, these lights aren't giving us enough light," and um, so they'd either put in new ones or freshen them up somehow. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, that it it's all like I say, it's all changed with the 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 long life of LEDs changes how the whole maintenance question. Um, electric light sources. So we're going to kind of power through these. Uh, so we talked about lamps and light bulbs. Both good. Um, we have these designations that are even true to some degree with LEDs. Um, so like this. This little LED lamp would be a, a par 20. Um, so it means it's 28 of an inch in diameter at its widest point. So we use this eighths of inches. Uh, and why do I care? Uh, because if it's if I'm replacing, say, an incandescent that was a a, an R, a, a 20. I can't put a 30 in there. There's, you know, I could go to the store and buy a, a 30, but it would be too big. So I, or if I'm specifying them, I'm ordering them, I need to get a, the same diameter so it'll fit. Um, then we have different shapes, T for tubular. So we talk about, you know, T8s, fluorescent. And if we're maybe looking at T LEDs, T LEDs are tubular. Um, R, MR, some of these are, Again, this would be a nominal, this is an LED par 20, um, but it, yeah, uh, and the diameter, it, it, it's not really behaving like a parabolic, it, par stands for parabolic illuminized reflector, but, you know, with an LED, the reflector isn't really a factor, so it's, it's, it's sort of a vestige, um, just like t, t, a lot of times we'll have a T, uh, you know, a fixture that use, would have used a T8, now we use an LED strip. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, some things have changed a little bit, but we still see this number, these alphanumerics combinations, and you'll, you'll see when we look at spec sheets later that like this 830, that means it's about 80 CRI and it's 3000 Kelvins. Um, so you, and we'll still see that occasionally in, in the spec sheets. Again, these shapes, A style, G style, T, uh, par, tubular again. So three broad categories of, of electric light sources, resistive, old style fluorescent, uh, rather incandescence, whether it be incand regular incandescent or halogen. We have discharge, uh, high pressure, uh, high intensity, and then low low pressure. Uh, the fluorescence are all discharge sources, metal halide, mercury vapor, et cetera. And then solid state, uh, LED, uh, OLED, we'll touch on those, and then electroluminescent, kind of obsolete now. Uh, you see these like in, sometimes in um, uh, airplanes, it'll be like a, a little glowing tape 
on the floor, maybe sometimes in theaters, but even those are being replaced by LEDs. Okay, this is what it's come down to. Uh, with, with this class on light sources, I used to spend like 10 slides more. I'd spend a lot of slides on incandescent, talking about all the properties. Forget about it. I think I've got one slide uh, and we're done with incandescence. But basically, it's a, it's a glowing piece of metal, a filament, a little piece of metal in there that you, you heat up with electricity, it gets hot and starts to incandescent. It's inside glass because it generates a ton of heat and glass can handle it. Whereas a lot of LED fixtures, you know, like this little LED here, it's all plastic. Um, not so much heat, doesn't matter. Uh, and then we have the different shapes. One thing to know about incandescent is, so here's its spectral power distribution. Sometimes we're trying to replicate that with LED sources. Uh, this is called a continuous uh, distribution, meaning there's no gaps really. Uh, it happens to have a lot of red uh, and not as much blue, but it has enough blue so that we can see, you know, see blue colors. Um, this would continue on. There's a lot of heat. This this whole thing would continue past the visible spectrum into infrared, uh, et cetera. That's it for fluorescent, for incandescent. Now for fluorescent, I think we got one slide. A glass tube, whether it be bent or just a long tube, we have a little thing called a cathode, which is like a filament. Electricity is applied to it. It starts throwing off, uh, it, well, between these two ends, this end and this end, it creates a plasma stream across there, which is ultraviolet light. Um, can't really see it. So we have a little mercury in there to keep that plasma stream going. And what we do see is phosphors. So we apply phosphors to the inside of this tube and they take that ultraviolet light and convert it into visible light. And we'll look at that in a second um, in another application. And so we've got, this, this is a discontinuous spectrum. We've got a spike of blue, a spike of green, and a spike of red. Just so happens those correspond to our, kind of where our cones are most receptive. So we, we can make all kinds of good colors with this if we do it right, um, depending on the proportions. And then high intensity discharge uh, uses a slightly different, well, similar principle. There's these little, creates a, a very high int intense arc between these two uh, electrodes here. This is a, you know, this is a smaller glass chamber. Um, it's like the surface of the sun in here. I mean, it's just blasting away photons. And depending on what we fill that little chamber with, whether it be sodiums, halides, et cetera, we get different kinds of colors um, as, they, as those things start to, to react. And again, another discontinuous wave front. Um, one of the things to know about high intensity discharge is it take, it has a strike time. Incandescent light, you flip the light switch, boom, you get light. Fluorescent, pretty much the same. Flip the switch, you get usable light. With all of these, you flip the switch, nothing happens. Uh, and it could be minutes before you start to get usable light. This thing has to develop heat, has to really ramp up. And then once it's going, if there's a power interruption, even for a second, it has to some in the case of metal halide it has to cool down and then start that process over again. It can take you know seven or eight minutes. Uh, we had a problem as you may recall. Some of you might recall uh, years ago with a Super Bowl or there was a football game. I think it might have been the Super Bowl or, uh, and the lights. There was a power interruption and they had to delay the game for a while to to get the lights back on. Um, you might know that this the. Uh, uh, where the Mariner Stadium, I think it's, is it called uh, T-Mobile, um, uses LEDs now. Uh, and they have for uh, probably, I think, eight years, seven or eight years or so. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Next time you go there to see a ball game, check it out. And uh, again, high intensity discharge can be pretty mediocre, pretty crummy. Uh, or it can be great quality. If LEDs hadn't come along, this is the light source we'd be talking about, ceramic metal halide. Uh, 
pretty great, except it's history. So we're not going to talk about it anymore. All of these light sources, uh, not all of them, incandescent doesn't, but the, the discharge sources use a thing called a ballast to make them go. Uh, the ballast provides a jolt of electricity uh, to start either the plasma stream or the arc, and then it uses uh, helps with current regulation to keep it to keep it operating properly. Um, LEDs have a thing called a driver, a similar thing. So okay, so now we get to LEDs, uh, the de facto light source du jour, uh, and so LEDs have different components. Inside there's a little chip uh, and it gets hooked up. So like this thing, this is an LED uh, module. The actual LED chip is behind this yellow stuff. Um, and, and this is a big chunk, a little chunk of metal to help dif dissipate heat. Because even though they're low energy, it's still a little area. So even though this might be two watts, it's two watts in a tiny area, so we got to get that to keep the thing uh, operating properly. Excellent uh, lumens per watt, a lot of good things. Uh, they can be small, right? So lots of these uh, lights were pretty large, and you had to have a big space to accommodate them. Uh, a lot of heat. Uh, and they got hot, you might be using 500 watt light bulbs or more in, in some big in, uh, commercial type spaces. Better optics, reduce maintenance, lots of good things. Wide range of colors, so we can make saturated colors with LEDs very easily in a whole range, uh, and then we can mix those colors so that to get any, any combination. Uh, and so there's two ways that we get white light with LEDs. Um, one way we can do it is with so-called, as I mentioned, RGB, red, blue, green. We mix those and we get variations on white depending on the proportions. Um, most, most LED platforms that are using RGB, especially if they're wanting white light, they usually add, say, either amber or maybe just a white LED to help improve the quality and the quantity of the white light. Uh, because even though this is technically true, it, there's problems with this. Uh, what, what's usually done is they take a blue LED and they dope it, so-called doping, uh, with phosphor, yellow phosphor. And from color theory, you might know that when you mix uh, blue and yellow, you get uh, variations on white. And uh, so over the years, one of the things that's happened with LEDs, especially in the early days, so they'd, they could do cool colors very well. They started life as blue, uh, but sometimes they didn't do the reds as well as they could. And we'll touch on that in just a second. Um, so this would be its spectral power distribution. Um, pretty good for white light and green, you know, and some other things, but not maybe not so much on the red. Uh, let's see. I've got a little demo here, one of my favorites. Um, so here is a LED bulb. Turn it on. Get lots of nice, just sort of white light from this thing. It's, um, you know, it looks it looks yellow. Why does it look yellow? Because it's it's got phosphors, and there's two ways to do phosphors. Uh, one is to put it on the chip itself. Um, let's see. But when you get a whole array of little chips, sometimes there's variations. And and depending on how you're doing it, those variations can be seen. They're subtle, but the eye is pretty, pretty discriminating. And so if there's subtle variations, it doesn't look right. And so the industry at one point was like, well, let's use remote phosphor. We'll put the phosphor out a little further, and then we it'll all blend. And so what they do... So here's a, so this is the LED I've taken off the phosphor. And so you can see it's just blue light, as blue as blue could be. Um, I don't know if you can see that, it's not, doesn't look as blue anyway, but it's, trust me, it's, it's, it's indigo. And then if we put the phosphor back 
on there. This isn't just yellow uh, plastic. It's it's phosphor embedded plastic. Now we get white light, and that's how it works. Um, and now I'm seeing spots. Uh, I don't know if that looked how that looked like on your end. Um, so and we so that's why occasionally you'll look um, at some recessed cans. This is a recessed can, and you'll see a a yellow a pretty good sized yellow disc. They're blending all that light in there to get a nice uniform white. Again, usually it's just little chips, and sometimes they'll put a diffuser. Philips brought this product to market years ago, and they had to pull it because people would look at it and say, "Well, I don't want a a, a yellow light. It looks like a bug light." They didn't understand that it was actually pretty good uh, white light. So we need to be a little careful with some of these descriptions. Um, so here we have, uh, you know, this is a little bit like when I talked earlier about beam spread. You know, we were talking about uh, spot and flood and medium. You know, what does that even really mean? And if I'm talking to one specifier and another one, well, we're using medium. Well, what, what's that? How, how many degrees? So you need a number, 25 degrees. Just like here, you know, I could talk about natural. What, it, what does natural even mean? Uh, well, in this case, it's somewhere between 4,000 and 5,000 kelvins. That's pretty good variation. Or soft white. What am I buying? Tissue? So it, it bright white. Well, I, they're all bright. Here it's just, it's just natural again. So you got to be careful with these these descriptions. No upset on that. Uh, one thing that we're seeing, which is pretty cool, is tunable. So with old old light sources, it would just came one way. Um, but like with LEDs, here's a cool LED. So I can turn it on and I get um, a cool white. Turn it on again, I get a warmer one, it's dim. Turn it on again, I get a bright one that's uh, cool, warm. So I can do it all over again, crazy. We couldn't do that before with uh, regular light sources. And you know, we're finding that maybe uh, changing the color of the light in, the, in say a work environment in particular, you know, so now we can change intensity over time a little bit, we get variation, maybe we change the color a little bit to, to one, provide variability, uh, but also maybe certain times of day, we might respond differently uh, to different colors of light. And this is an area of science and biology um, that goes beyond just the basic lighting designer. Uh, it really gets into almost medicine. Uh, so it, it's not something I'm going to get too deep into, but it is an area that you can spend a lot of time studying. Um, so I talked about the spectral power distribution of the basic LED. It starts out with a lot of blue and it can do yellows and greens pretty well, but maybe not so well with the red. And um, so that was something the industry needed to address. And um, color rendering should have told us, but the problem with color rendering is uh, color rendering is really just an average. They take these uh, eight uh, pastel samples in the, in the laboratory, shine their light source onto those samples, and how much light reflects off of those, they, they add it all up and weight it out, uh, uh, and average it out, and that becomes the, the average of the reflectance gives us the uh, color rendering index number. We call it RA for our average. And um, average can, can, you know, we can have our one hand in a couple, in a bucket of boiling water and another hand in a bucket of freezing water and average tells us we're comfortable. But of course, we're not comfortable at all. Um, so we were seeing the fact that we had a lot of good, uh, high numbers in the cool range, but not very much in the the warm ranges, and that was causing high num high color rendering index numbers, but not not good for uh, rendering red. And that would be complexions. Uh, all all complexions are based on red. We have red blood flowing through our veins and. Uh, and also in real retail, you know, we have red products, so we want it to look good. And we can see, you know, the old compact fluorescence down here 
had an RA and a, a CRI of about 87, but the R9, so the reflectance of nine, these, so we had these saturated colors and the, uh, the red, saturated red was one we're most interested in, would be down around 17, very low number. Uh, some of these incandescent light and halogen, very high um, uh, CRI, RA, and very high R9. So it would generally, that's why incandescent, we, we tend to like because it has a, a good color properties. Uh, but again, terrible life and uh, very short life and very low efficacy, expensive to operate. Um, here's a high quality LED, has a good CRI and has excellent R9. So that would be something we'd want to know about. Again, this is something you, you're you going to be needing to study more if you're getting involved in specifying, but, based, but you should know that R9 is a thing and you'll need to know a little bit about it. Um, that said, there is a whole new color metric that the industry is trying to adapt, taking some time. TM30, uh, if, which in theory would do away with CRI. Uh, you can probably tell from this class, if especially if you're just starting out, there's a dizzying amount of information. Most people have a hard time getting their minds around all of it. and uh, this method, though I think it's it's very good, is also hard for the for the end users. As a specifier, you might need to know about it, and you might need to be able to work with it. But trying to communicate to your client is going to be tricky. Um, so anyway, but TM30, you've heard it here first. Uh, LED lamps come in all shapes and sizes, uh, and that gives amazing versatility. You know, strips. Uh, and then we can adapt them to conventional light sources. Uh, when, you know, when you get into um, retrofitting in particular, sometimes funny things can happen. So we can take out the light source that was intended, put in say an LED platform and an LED uh, retrofit, and we get funny, funny things. And this is a function of not only the light source, but how it's interacting with the luminaire. In this case, it's not a huge problem, but it it could be. Um, LEDs have a thing called a driver. It functions much the same way the ballast does. Uh, sometimes they're called power supplies, um, but usually drivers. Uh, and again, this has to do with starting and operating uh, voltage and current. So when we get into <clears throat> controlling LEDs, uh, it, in terms of like dimming, as an example, um, it's complicated. Let's just say that uh, with a regular incandescent light source, we just have a simple resistor. Really, all this is is a resistor in here, um, and so we have a, a a dimmer, and it's very easy for it to talk to that resistor and tell it to dim. There's there's even potentially issues with incandescent dimming, but nothing compared to what we see with dimming a solid state device. So uh, so a, an LED is a little electronic component and it has to go through this electronic component from this electronic component. They all have to speak the same language in the same way. And if I have, so here's one manufacturer. And so maybe I have one dimming circuit and I'm dimming recess cans and some track all on the same dimmer. Well, it's got it speaking to maybe two different manufacturers. It's it's kind of crazy, um, especially when you get into retrofits. So, for instance, uh, uh, Lutron has a compatibility for one of their dimmers. Lutron's a manufacturer of dimmers, uh, and they have a compatibility chart. So, if you're using, you know, the EcoSmart eight watt LED, it'll work. There's 40 pages of this document. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, different dimming protocols. Again, we, there's whole classes on this subject, but you know whether you're using zero to 10 volt dimming, uh, DMX, Dolly, um, some sort of proprietary dimming platform. Uh, you all need to. They all need to to uh, have their own. Uh, it all has to. It all has to be compatible. It all has to work. You have to check 
every little piece. So you can't just try one on one on one dimmer and say, well, it's going to work for everything. Uh, it may not. Uh, flickers become a thing now with um, with LEDs. Uh, it used to be a problem with certain discharge sources uh, where we'd see some flickering, fluorescent lighting, old style fluorescent lighting used to flicker um, noticeably. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's mildly annoying, hugely annoying or disastrous. It just depends on the setting. You know, if it's, if you have a little bit of flicker in maybe, you know, an application like an airport concourse where people are just walking through, they're not spending time there not a big deal. If you have a lot of flicker in a concert hall where you dim the lights down and one of them starts blinking, uh, that's a deal breaker. It cannot happen. It's a showstopper. So it's going to vary. All right. Here's uh, OLED, so-called organic Eric, LEDs. Yes. I'm going to interrupt you really quick back to um, uh, Kind of, kind of on the topic of of flickering. I think um, does yes. dimming and does dimming an LED increase the efficiency? Oh, the efficiency. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, you do get into power curves. Um, so, like with an inc and I'll I'll keep this brief. But with an incandescent light, you know, if you dimmed it fifty percent, you might still be using seventy five percent of the power. Right, the light level. There's, there's dimming is a funny thing. So there's uh, dimming to 50% of perceived level, which may not in fact be 50% power. Then you could dim to 50% power, which may not translate into a corresponding light level. And then there's uh, dimming to say 50% on the dial. You know, I, or my little lever. I move the lever down to 50%. Well, that may not get me 50% of anything. Uh, so all of these need to be taken into account. You have what's called nonlinear uh, power curves or nonlinear perception curves. And um, so when you ask, so, and they don't all they don't track together. Uh, so you you have to ask what you're dimming to. Are you dimming to a perceived light level, or a? Um, a, a but with with LEDs, they tend to be more linear, a little more linear. Right? Once they start dimming, sometimes we've seen uh, LED platforms where you move this, you'll move the dimmer, you know, maybe maybe 30 percent, nothing's happening, and suddenly you get a lot of dimming. And then it's then it gradually goes off again. Other times, as soon as you start to dim it, it starts to dim, and then it then it's then there's, there's almost no noticeable change until much later. Uh, so you need to look at the dimming curve uh, to determine, and that's going to be particular to the dimmer itself, the driver, and and possibly the the LED uh, the LED platform. So yeah. It's it's kind of a mess. Do we need a, a webinar on <laughs> on dimming LEDs? Um, yeah, you know, I think possibly. I think more than that, um, you need to test every system because they're going to behave differently. Uh, and and that's one of the things that we've the industry has found is it's not it's not predictable. Um, it depends on the quantity and then the makeup of what you're dimming so yeah maybe we do i don't know but i gotta power through this we're gonna we're gonna hit the the noontime mark here uh in a blaze of glory all right so um but duly noted thank you uh organic leds so these are as you can see it's a it's a that is the light source bendable uh, you know, I like to say OLEDs are the light source of the future and always will be. Uh, you know, they they don't have quite the efficacy of the um, – these numbers have changed a little bit. I've talked to some of the manufacturers, and they're like, hey, they're getting better. You know, 60 lumens per watt. Well, we were, we're seeing 
over 150 typically for regular LEDs. Um, 80 CRI is pretty good. Uh, 18,000 hours, that's not that great. But these numbers have all changed a bit. So, you know, they're improving incrementally. Um, but uh, I see them as more of a novelty, uh, actually. You know, if you want to do interesting things with form, um, just like you'd have sconces or decorative uh, luminaires, which gets us to the subject of uh, luminaires. Is it a light source or is it a luminaire? You know, we go back to this one. These are all these little uh, OLED squares, so like, you know, about four inches on a side, and you put them together and you get something kind of kind of cool. Um, so maybe the thing itself becomes a luminaire. Um, so luminaires um, <clears throat> is a complete lighting unit designed to safely hold safely hold uh, the light source in space and direct the light uh, in the intended way while providing glare control, shielding components that are not intended to be seen. Also known as a light fixture or sometimes light fitting if you're across the Atlantic. Um, Additionally, luminaire, the luminaire needs to be consistent with the overall design scheme of the architecture, uh, the style. Uh, so the luminaire would have have light sources in it, right? So we'd have our LEDs in there. Uh, it would have drivers, might have reflectors. So if we look at this one, you can see, in fact, but this one, you can see, see that yellow in there. That's, that's the, the chip with the phosphors. And we've got a lens we can see. Uh, sometimes these little, so this is a screw in, but it's got all, a lot of stuff in it. it. All it needs is a power source. We need to screw it into a, a power source. Uh, and it's got its own little driver built into it, housings, etc. You know, effective lighting means design means putting light where it's wanted and eliminating it where it's not wanted. That's, that's the nut of lighting design. You just had a complete lighting design class. Um, but it's hard to do that. And so there's many other factors you need to consider um, when when deploying your light fixtures. And if it was that easy, you know, we wouldn't be having classes like this. Um, we also look at light distribution. Uh, so we're here we're looking at say this fixture, and we can we can to, we look at how the light comes out if we take a cross section. This fixture can have a luminous top. So we can have light coming out the top, light coming out the bottom, no light coming out the top, uh, and, or light coming out asymmetrically or in a narrow way, uh, all from the same fixture. So we have reflectors, uh, and reflectors can be made out of different materials. Uh, they can be, uh, and they can have different qualities. They can be a matte finish, they can be, uh, specular, which is like mirror-like. Well, I think we'll touch on that in a second. They can be uh, hammered, uh, so they're textured. They can be white, and, uh, and or they can be asymmetric. So uh, angle of reflection equals angle of incidence. So the light comes down and goes off in a new direction, but mostly unchanged. We can have a diffuse reflector with a, where we've got, so there's a white material that's textured, so the light hits that and then starts to bounce off in a whole variety of ways. We can have a spread reflector where it hits it and it goes in the same direction, but now it's spreading out. And then we can do com combinations thereof where maybe we get uh, an asymmetric we want more light energy going one way than, than another one, but mostly in the same direction, or we can change it up. Uh, the, the reflectors that you'll see mostly in the industry would be parabolic, um, spherical, and ellipsoidal. These are the two big ones, parabolic and ellipsoidal. Note that with the parabolic, we have our light source, and the light comes out sort of in a, a coherent direction. The thing about ellipsoidal is we have our light source and we have a focal point that occurs outside of the reflector and then continues out. Asymmetric, why would we want asymmetric? 
Well, if we're trying to watch a wall, so here's a wall and here's our light source, we have an asymmetric reflector. We want more light energy going down than across because this is much closer and light, light level drops off uh, uh, significantly as you move away from the light source. So we wanna put more light energy down there so we can have a more uniform light, uh, lighting. And so this shows us we're getting more light down. Here's 90 degrees, there's 90 degrees, here's zero degrees, zero degrees. So for lighting this wall, we want more light energy down. A shielding and refracting, so we want to usually not see the light source. So we have a light source in here. It could be LEDs, it could be a fluorescent tube, and we have a nice diffuser there that hopefully looks pleasant, uh, and that can uh, help shape the light. So lenses uh, can transmit the light through and just diffuse it a little bit, but not change it too much. So a spread. We can diffuse it significantly, so it starts coming out in all directions, or not not all, but still transmits through mostly. We can selectively uh, send the light out. So we want certain portions of the light not to pass through. Maybe we're trying to keep heat out or ultraviolet out. So we want it, we want it to be reflective to those portions of the spectrum, but only visible light comes through. Uh, and we may want to absorb the um, the light and just send a portion uh, another direction. And then we may also wanna change the direction of the light uh, with refraction. And we see those brought to bear with in LEDs. Uh, so we can have, um, in the case of a of a uh, this kind of ellipsoidal type lens where the light comes through, we can have a very narrow aperture with our fixture we're still getting all that light out, and then uh, it goes into the into the space, or we can just spread it. We have Fresnel lens or an ellipsoidal lens. So one of the things that a in this case we we these are parabolic reflectors. So here we have a side view of this so-called troffer. Uh, here's a, a recessed can side view cutaway. Uh, Sometimes we're just trying to shield our direct view from a normal viewing angle of the light source itself. You know, we do, we, if someone's going to stand right underneath a fixture and look straight up in the air, you can't really, that's not part of the design process. Uh, but from a normal viewing angle, we want to not see the light source. Okay. Reflectors can be specular, yes. Diffuse, yes. Uh, ellipsoidal, uh, sort of, yes. Uh, incidental, no, that was it, I made that up. And asymmetrical, yes. So all of these, except the incidental, uh, are true. So direct luminaires. So here's uh, our side view of a troffer, let's say. And it, with a direct luminaire, uh, ni uh, 90 to 100% of the light is directed down into the space, usually onto a task surface. With an indirect luminaire, 90 to 100% of the light is directed out, usually up to the ceiling. It could be mounted, wall mounted, it could be um, pendant hung uh, up onto hopefully a reflective surface to come back down in space. <clears throat> With indirect luminaires, so here's our, here's our our ceiling, we've got two fixtures hanging here. It's a little like this one maybe. And ideally, well usually we want them, the light to come out and join more or less. So we get uniform lighting. If we have them separated, we have dark spots in between. Like here we have this dark spot. Not necessarily a deal breaker, but usually we're not going for that. So we wanna have the, how far down they are and how close they are is going to be a function, uh, and how wide they spread the light is going to be a function of how what our spacing interval will be. Um, I just included this slide because it blew my mind. Um, so here, this is the same hallway. 
I walked in the door. That was that's not me, but that's somebody leaving. I walked in the door, walked about halfway through, and I could turn one direction. I took this picture. I turned 180 degrees, and I took this picture. This is one space. What we're seeing here is direct lighting, although it's bouncing off the wall, but we can see it's coming direct into the space. And here we have indirect lighting. The, the furniture is different. The wall floors are different. It's almost like there were two different design teams. And one said, okay, fine. You get the first 30 feet, and I get the second 30 feet. And we're going to see which one we like better. I don't know. It was so weird. All right. Um, most often we see some combination of indirect and direct in these pendant lights. Uh, so there's some amount of light goes down and some goes up to light the space. And then occasionally, well, you know, we'll see sort of an omnidirectional where this is a classic omnidirectional, this, this, you know, just round sphere, but we could have a decorative fixture that's putting out mostly light in all directions. Uh, there also happen to be other decorative fixtures and some accent lighting here and there to make the space feel a little less uh, uniform, because here we just get even shadowless light. It's kind of cool, but, you know, there really ought to be some light for this artwork and maybe some other lighting on this console here. Um, adjustable lighting can be quite handy. Uh, if it's done right, you need to be careful so we can direct light uh, onto different things. You do need to be careful that you're not trying to shine it too far away from where where it is, because then you can get glare uh, if it's shining at too steep an angle. Everyone always asks, well, how, where do I put them? This kind of gets into design, um, but why not? So it's a function of how far out from the wall is a function of ceiling height. Typically, you want about a anywhere from a, ideally a 45 degree angle, but it could be 60 degree, it could be 30 degree, somewhere in there. Um, and so if this ceiling was higher, I'd have the lights out farther. You could just sort of project this line out and that tells you the distance out from the wall based uh, as a function of ceiling height to light some artwork. Uh, we can do wall grazing uh, where we're putting the light in a little slot. Uh, we can do wall washing where we're trying to uniformly wash the wall with light. So looking at catalog cut sheets, um, sometimes they don't tell us all that much. You know, useful information would be the, some dimensions, uh, s some specifications, information about the electronics, information about the optics, the photometrics, if there's the spacing ratio is relevant. We talked about the the, pendant, the indirect pendants, you know, how far apart would they need to be based on, you know, and we see that with recessed cans, how, what would be the spacing ratio? We see that in uh, high bay applications, shielding and cutoff angles, um, so, and, and then the, the efficiency. So here we get mostly information about the, um, the finishes we can get, a little description, what kind of lamp it takes, uh, but not a lot of, photometric information, and, and there may not be much. You know, this is mostly a decorative fixture. Uh, other times we get tons of information uh, about photometrics, uh, electronics, its controllability. Uh, let's see if, I think we go into some details on this, this these two cut sheets. This is for a little recessed, adjustable recessed can, different trim packages, different colors, so let's see. So here we have specifications that talk about those things. You could cut and paste a lot of this into a spec sheet. Um, and it gets into more details about colors, 2200 Kelvin, all the way up to 4000 Kelvins. Um, what kind of reflectors? It has 10 degree, 25 degree. See, now you know what all this stuff means. Dimming options. Um, uh, I don't see, oh, mounting. So it, uh, yeah, I don't see spacing ratio here, but I think it might tell us uh, somewhere else. They also try to give you, so you like, how do I order one of these things? They try to give you an example usually to help you figure out the ordering codes um, for the housing or the, and the trim. So for instance, the trim options is square. This only comes one way, adjustable, uh, one inch regress. 
uh, wet location is the only way it comes. Sometimes it's damp location or wet location. Um, different uh, trim styles. <clears throat> Lensing, uh, no, no glass. Uh, it, you can have glass frosted or clear. That's going to change the beam uh, and the optics. Uh, different finishes, etc. And then we can get into uh, the wattage. I can get all the way up to 33 watts or 9 watts. I'm going to get different amounts of light, different color temperatures, uh, different color renderings. I can go 80 all the way up to 90 uh, CRI, depending on which one I use. Different beam angles, so all that, all that good stuff. And then different ways you can dim it. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll just blast right through this one. One thing, though, we see occasionally, especially like with linear type fixtures, is um, the optics will change whether you're going along the axis of the fixture or across the axis of the fixture. So across the axis, I get this kind of distribution. And the assumption is, so they show you this, the assumption is it would be the same the other way. So this is just a half of it. This would be the 90 degree. The other would be uh, 270 degree. Um, but then if we go along the fixture, it's more uniform. Here it's more asymmetric. We call this sort of a, in the industry, we call this a bat wing style. Uh, this would just be more uh, what we call um, Lambertian. How do we get all this information? With giant machinery? No, actually, these are little guys. They're 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 like elves, and they they work in these uh, little little factory. No, these are this is a this is a big re, uh, uh, reflector here, and we put our light fixture there, and that thing moves around the the, the fixture and takes data points, uh, hundreds of data points, and tells us what the optics are going to be. And here we put the whole sometimes the whole entire fixture inside this chamber. It tells us how many lumens we're going to get. So we have an integrating sphere and a going neo photometer. Um, <clears throat> so I, we're getting close to the end here, and I just want to make sure that you, you get this bit of information. So here's these, this fixture. It comes all these different ways, different amounts of lumens. And when we try to pick one, so here, so let's take the 30,000 lumen package. So this is the high, the high wattage, or high, high lumens. We don't, it's nominally 30,000 lumens, but if we do 4,000 kelvins at 70 CRI, we only get 2,900, 29,000 lumens, which is pretty good. It's most, it's almost the 30,000. So there's nothing wrong with that. But let's say we're putting this in a food court, uh, or maybe it's high up in some airport concourse. And we, we don't want 4,000 Kelvins or 70 CRI. We want 3,000 Kelvins, warmer, and a higher CRI to make, uh, maybe it's in a, a, a target, and we want the colors, everything to look vibrant. But guess what happens to the lumens? Now we're down to 1,800 lumens, 18,000 lumens, 600. So we're losing lumens. Now that's not necessarily the end of the story. Maybe that's what we need for this application, and that's just just how it is. Uh, but let's say we're putting this in a, uh, a warehouse where, you know, 70 CRI is, is pretty good and 4,000 Kelvin is more appropriate. So this, we wouldn't use this in a warehouse. We'd use this one, higher lumens, less fixtures or more light. Maybe we can go to a lower, lower lumen package to get the same amount of light. Uh, our lumens per watt changes. So with the 4,000 Kelvin, 125 lumens per watt, the 3,000 Kelvin, 90, uh, 80 lumens per watt. So you just need to know which one to use. Um, uh oh, I think I've I've talked too long. Hopefully, uh, I think I'm just going to go through this one. Uh, so here's a case where we've got a compact fluorescent fixture, and we want to put in. Um, it it uses for 1800 lumen compact fluorescent lamps, uh, 7,200 total lumens. So if we were gonna pick two LED equivalents for that, here's one that's 2,500 lumens, and here's one that's uh, say 2,000 lumens. 
well, it looks like neither one of these is close. So why, how could I do that? If, but if we look at the photometrics for this fixture, our 7,200 lumens, we see that the efficiency of that fixture is only 37%. That means almost 60% of the light never makes it out of this fixture. So our 20, 7,200 lumens is really only 2,600. So now when we start looking at this fixture, it's not so bad, and this one might even be a possibility. So let's take a closer look. Here's this uh, fixture, fixture LED A, we'll call it. So it says source lumens. No, it. So that's just the lumens from the light source. And so if the if the efficiency of that fixture is anywhere close to what the efficiency is of that compact fluorescence fixture, we're going to lose a lot of light. We don't know the luminaire efficiency because they never really put it through uh, the testing. Whereas this one's delivered lumens and we get 1800. So this might actually be our best choice. Even though the lumens look like they're less, they're the actual lumens you'll get. So when you look at sometimes these uh, uh, lumen outputs, here it says light output lumens. That's the total, that's the luminaire lumens. If you make any changes in that, you have to run a whole new uh, photometric test. So that's the old style photometry is called relative photometry. That's where you take the source lumens, put it in the luminaire and look at the, based on the luminaire efficiency. But with LEDs, a lot of the times they use absolute photometry. And that's where they take the whole fixture as a system and put it into it and test it. All right. So I think this might be <clears throat> our last, I don't know if it is our last one. Luminaire efficiency is not always relevant with LED fixtures. Uh, dependent on CCT, varies depending on the, the components, is measured in foot candles, uh, and the percentage of light out of the fixture relative to the light source. Uh, well, all of these um, can be somewhat true. Uh, it's the efficiency is not always relevant for LEDs because sometimes it's the, the well, they don't do the, the luminaire efficiency. It's not necessarily dependent on CCT, although it, it can be. We notice it changed, the amount of lumens we got changed depending uh, on the color temperature. It varies depending on the components. So if I change the optics, I'm gonna, I might change the efficiency um, depending on the, the lensing. Uh, we don't measure it in foot candles. Uh, it, it is the percentage of light that comes out. Here's a case where we have uh, a lighting retrofit. And um, the problem with this retrofit is this, these lights were supposed to light this piece of artwork. And even though this is an efficient fixture, LED fixture, it doesn't actually do the job. So we'll just keep that in the back of our back pocket. Okay, so here's a luminaire checklist. I'm gonna have you look through this on your own time, but these are questions you would wanna ask when you're looking at any lights, uh, light fixture, like, will the distribution put light where I want it? So we saw in the case of this, no. The answer is no. So why buy it? Why do it? Or maybe I need to change it. Uh, construction issues, will the, con will the controls be compatible? Um, is the frame durable enough? Is the lens durable enough? Uh, are there any special power requirements? And are there any issues with driver compatibility? Uh, and the warranty. So here's a case where we had a five to 10 year warranty for this fixture uh, by a two year old company and they're out of business now. So I don't know what that happens to your, to your warranty. Uh, and are there any special hazards in the environment uh, that we need to worry about like water or volatile uh, things in the air so all right well i thank you very much uh the most effective luminaire is energy efficient has appropriate color qualities puts light where it's needed has low operating costs is controllable and is all of the above and i appreciate your time i'm sorry i went a little over hopefully some of you have hung in there and now a few words from lighting design <laughs> <laughs> I'll go really fast. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, reminder, this is uh, recorded, so uh, those of you who are not here to hear me say this, 
but you can go on the oh uh, website um, and see the last few minutes of this um, and get the slide deck. Next slide. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I don't think it's, I think it just has your contact information. Yeah. Um, it, it, when in doubt, go to lightingdesignlab.com. All of that is there too. Um, and just a reminder, we've got a class on the 22nd with Eric about uh, lighting audits and retrofits. All right. I'll be faster, that is I it. promise. <laughs> thanks everyone for bearing with our first of the, of the season. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.